All right. How's the silent disco? Everyone hear me? I wish I, I, wish I had music. Um, this is cool. OK, so uh, today we're going to be talking about LLMs. We use that word a lot now. I'm honestly, I'm ready for a new word. But uh, we're going to have some fun with Docker and LLMs. All right. So a little bit about myself. I'm a co-founder and uh, the chief information security officer at Weights and Biases. Uh, this is the second company that I've, I've started. Prior to Weights and Biases, founded a company called Figure Eight, where we also helped machine learning teams get training data to, to build ML models. Uh, when I started my first company in like 2007, uh, and we talked to investors, when we said we were going to help people doing machine learning, it was actually it made it harder for us to raise money. It was kind of like a naughty word. It was too risky. It didn't seem like it was very promising. Uh, as we all know, that world has very much changed today. Here's you know, the AI50 uh, from Sequoia. And all of these companies are doing something um, core to, to AI. We've also seen an explosion in open source models, uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Uh, and there's this cool. Uh, GitHub repo that kind of keeps track of all these new models as they're getting posted and shows you an actual leaderboard, uh, which is a, a great resource. But we're going to be working with one of those models today, good old Code Llama, with a sick image generated by uh, maybe Stable Diffusion or DALI. OK, so today's agenda. First, I'm going to do a brief overview of kind of how we got here, just lay of the land. Um, then I'm going to talk about kind of three core LLM workflows, and then spend most of the time doing an actual live demo where we're evaluating models and using weights and biases. So how we got here, uh, lots and lots of parameters. Who in the audience knows what weights and biases are in this context? Show of hands. A few. OK. Weights and biases are the parameters. In a, in a model. So it's what we're training the model to do. It's learning all of these floating point numbers that you can conceptually think of as the, if a neural network is a bunch of neurons, these weights and biases are the strength of the connection between any of these neurons. Uh, GPT-3 had about 175 billion weights and biases, uh, which is a lot. Uh, and then Palm, 540 billion. Uh, we're seeing the ability to actually run models these lar this large because of, of Moore's law and our ability to build really fast matrix multipliers with NVIDIA GPUs or, say, TPUs or other specialized hardware. Um, so there's no reason to believe this trend is like leveling out, right? I think that's really at the root of a lot of the excitement, is if we made this much progress in the last few years, that progress seems like it's going to continue. Um, also at the heart of this revolution is the transformer. Not that transformer, this one. Uh, this is 2017, a paper called Attention is All You Need, talked about using this transformer architecture to model um, time series. And if you think about language, it is just a time series. It's a bunch of, of words kind of rolling across the page over time. The advantages of this architecture is it's really easy to parallelize over a whole bunch of different GPUs, right? So GPT-4 was trained on probably thousands of GPUs at the same time. And this architecture allows you to kind of run all of those at the same time to, to train the models. Uh, GPT-4 is transformer-based. Uh, I think things really changed. December of last year when ChatGPT was released. Prior to ChatGPT, right, OpenAI had released GPT-2 probably three years ago. And then uh, they also opened GPT-3. And we were users of it at Weights and Biases. We thought it was really cool. We were showing our friends, our family. But it wasn't until ChatGPT that the world, like, everyone's minds were blown. Um, the transformer can actually be used to tokenize anything. So obviously, we have these large language models, but you can use the transformer to tokenize images. You can turn the images into little patches and feed them through as a time series. You can do the same thing with speech or sound, audio. Uh, there's some really cool models now. Maybe some of you have, have 
played with them that generate kind of music from, from text. Really, anything you can kind of tokenize into a series of, of tokens, you can put into a transformer. And we're seeing lots of uh, really cool stuff happening now uh, with multimodal models. So ChatGPT, for instance, now accepts images. Uh, so you can have both image data and text data and audio data, maybe video data uh, in the future go into the model and then spit out um, predictions based on that information. Uh, and you can do the same thing with like medical information. So we're seeing companies that take uh, genetic sequences or uh, different proteins and feed that through transformers to predict how to uh, fold a protein or make a new novel drug. Uh, so let's talk about weights and biases and how we help people with these, uh, this explosion of transformer models. Weights and biases is your machine learning system of record. You can think of it as like GitHub for machine learning efforts, whereas GitHub helps with coding and just raw human source code. Weights and biases helps with those parameters, the, the actual learned assets uh, in an ML ops pipeline. We let you version both data sets and models. Uh, you can communicate and collaborate with uh, your peers, and you can richly visualize information about all of these models. So at Weights and Biases, we think of three core personas in the world of large language models. You have the LLM creators, uh, most of which are customers of Weights and Biases, folks like OpenAI, Anthropic. Um, then we have the LLM fine tuners, those that are kind of taking an existing LLM, such as Llama or Code Llama, and actually fine tuning it on very specific data that's, that's core to their use case. And lastly, we have LLM prompt engineers, which is now kind of opened up the market to any software developer who can just use these things and kind of tweak the way in which they prompt it. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, all of these opening or LLM creators are actually using weights and biases to, to help them create their LLMs. Uh, this is our head of product, Carrie at OpenAI, um, probably like four years ago when we first started. Uh, and this is Peter Wellander, one of the lead researchers there, showing a weights and biases dashboard uh, for one of the models that they were training. These models are massive, so it's very complicated to train, and it takes a lot of, of expertise. So if I were giving advice to someone, I would say, you know, probably let the big boys do this, because it's like insanely expensive, right? We're talking like tens of millions of dollars in infrastructure. But by using weights and biases, they're able to really scale across big teams working on big problems like this. Uh, and we're also able to help smaller teams. So this is a really cool project. You can find it at wmd.me slash Dali journal. Um, so one of, uh, one of an engineer that's, that we've worked with for quite some time at weights and biases as a, as a friend who's also a machine learning engineer when Dali came out, the image generation algorithm, he said, oh, I wonder if I could build a model that's a little smaller, but anyone could use. And he created this, this model called Dali Mini, which now is called Crayon. But he kept a journal on weights and biases about everything he learned during that, that process, which is really helpful. Um, Eleuther AI also published all of their weights and biases projects for training GPTJ, GPT Neo X, um, and others. So if you do, find yourself with $10 million that you'd like to give to one of these clouds uh, and want to create an LLM from scratch, uh, we do have a white paper. Um, this could also be useful outside of, of actually creating LLMs. All right, the fine tuners. So uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of Hugging Face. Now you've got this massive repository of models. Um, and you can take these models, and with a few lines of code, you can actually fine tune them. You can take the weights and biases that were learned for the general use case and feed in data that's specific to your use case and have those weights and biases changed such that it's better at your specific use case. You can kind of turn it into a specialist. Uh, we have integrations with Hugging Face that give you these nice dashboards automatically if you um, have weights and biases installed. We can also help with hyperparameter search. So when you're fine tuning these models, it's not clear what the best settings are gonna be. How, how big should your batch size be? How, um, how fast should your learning rate be? These are all decisions that state of the art is you just try a bunch of them and you see which one works best. Uh, and we provide tools to help you do that uh, trial and error. 
And then lastly, Weights and Vices Artifacts lets you track data lineage. So as you're fine tuning these models, you're going to be fine tuning it on some data set. That data set is likely going to evolve and change. Uh, so you want to keep track of exactly what data was used to train which version of your model. And Weights and Biases gives you this lineage tracking um, ability. And lastly, you can log actual examples from your model. Whether you're doing computer vision or audio or textual models, you can actually log maybe what the prompt to the model was and then what um, was output. And then lastly, once you have a model that you fine tune and you want to share it with, with other members of the team, you can publish it to the model registry, which is a central place for um, you to know all of the models, what versions they are um, that are you know, currently being used. So Weights and Bias has been around for about five years. We've tracked over 200 million hours of uh, using compute to fine tune or train um, ML models. All right, LLM for prompt engineers. This is what we're going to be hacking on today. Uh, at Weights and Biases, we actually created our own bot. So if you go to wb.me slash discord, you can chat with the Weights and Biases bot about Weights and Biases, and it will give you, um, hopefully, correct and clear answers about how to use the Weights and Biases tool. Uh, and we also publish this course for folks that want to build applications um, using LLMs. You can find it at wb.me slash LLMs apps course. Uh, as this boom uh, occurred this year after ChatGPT, we had to stop and ask ourselves, does building the best tools for machine learning practitioners actually still matter when these models kind of out of the box are, are so good? Uh, and as I'm sure many of you have experienced, you find out quick that, well, there are edge cases where it's really not good. So here's an example. We're saying, hey, give me a list of the countries. Start with the letter O. And it seems to have missed uh, what we asked for. And then we said, are you sure? Which, honestly, this is actually a really cool approach that often works. If you just ask the LLM, like, are you sure? It will give you the correct answer. In this case, it did not. It's still giving us um, country names that do not start with the letter O. Then we asked, like, why did it? It seems to be just randomly removing things that have nothing to do with our original intent. Um, so LLMs have a number of problems, right? There's a knowledge cutoff. These big LLMs are always going to be trained on data that happened in the past. So any new events aren't going to be a part of its training data set. Uh, the training data might have been uh, spoiled in some way. Potentially, you trained on too much like nasty Reddit data, and now you've got uh, a nasty LLM. It hallucinates. It will you know, gladly just tell you a bold-faced lie. Um, and they are very expensive to, to retrain. So a common solution is to actually stuff the relevant logic or the, the relevant knowledge into the prompt to the model. So uh, retrieval augmented generation involves you know, asking a question. We take that question. And then we talk to an embedding model to search our docs to get an actual chunk of documentation for the relevant question. Then I can pass that chunk of documentation into the model and ask the question with that information. So now the model is able to use this up-to-date data and is often going to give you a much better answer. Uh, all right, and then lastly, I'm going to talk about some tools for prompt engineers. So first is our uh, Langchain tracer. Um, so if you're using Langchain, or even if you're just manually chaining calls to these LLMs together, you can get these nice traces akin to what you'd see in like Datadog or an APM tracking module to dive in and see the individual steps in your chain and maybe uh, where they failed or where they succeeded. So in this case, we had a model that was converting English into a SQL query. And we can see a few of these actually failed. They were unsuccessful. We can dive into the chain and see you know, where the failure is and what the actual error is. So in this case, the call to OpenAI generated invalid SQL. So when we tried to like, execute that SQL, we, we got an error. Uh, we can also monitor just the usage of LLM APIs. So what we're seeing from big enterprises is they want to be sure that sensitive data isn't uh, leaking out of 
their internal silos. Um, so we have a proxy that you can funnel all of your requests to uh, OpenAI APIs through. And we'll actually, did that not update? Hmm. There it is, all right. So this is a monitoring dashboard where we're actually seeing all users within an organization and how many requests to say OpenAI they're making. And then we can actually dive into the uh, prompts and outputs. So we're seeing companies that want to ensure um, that sensitive data isn't leaking using a dashboard like this to uh, have that accountability and governance. All right, so that's my brief overview. Now let's go ahead. It's live demo time. Let's see if we can't get some stuff to uh, crash. Um, all of the, the demo code is available on GitHub. If you go to github.com slash WNB examples, then you can navigate to uh, examples llama CPP. OK. So I've got a, this is a GPU box on um, Google Cloud. It's just running JupyterLab. Uh, and this is where we'll be running uh, our code today. So the task I decided to work on is automating the evaluation of different LLMs. Specifically, we're going to make an LLM that can take a pure English question about Docker, and it's going to output a Docker command. How sick is that? OK. Very, very on topic. So I've got a very small data set here. But the idea would be like spin up a new container named Busy Server One with the latest version of the BusyBox image and place it under the high priority C group parent in the background. And then our ideal output is Docker run dash D dash dash name C group parent BusyBox. So we've got 10 of these examples. In a real world uh, evaluation, you're going to want hundreds of these. But just to keep things snappy, we're, we're using a small um, data set. Uh, I built a Docker file. So one thing I did want to call out is it could be tricky uh, using Docker with machine learning workloads because of the variety of accelerators that are out there. Um, the easiest is, is NVIDIA. So if you're able to get a machine with an NVIDIA GPU, you can build from an NVIDIA CUDA base image. It's going to have all of the accelerated libraries in there, and then you can kind of go nuts. Uh, we're using a tool today called Llama CPP. Who's heard of Llama.cpp? A couple folks? OK. This project is sick. It's one of my favorite projects on GitHub right now. Um, it's all written in C++, and it allows you to take uh, kind of downsampled versions of models and run it on any hardware. So you can run it on your laptop. Uh, you can run it on a Raspberry Pi. You can run it on an NVIDIA GPU. It just works. It's very cool. Uh, but now, if I were to run this directly on my MacBook inside of Docker, I'm actually going to miss out on the acceleration I can get natively. So by using like Apple Metal, I'm able to go very fast. But I don't have the Apple Metal APIs exposed inside of Docker, because that's running in a Linux VM. Uh, maybe one day, I know there's like a bunch of projects going on, we'll be able to like call these cool accelerated Apple um, chips from with inside Docker, but not today. So we're going with CUDA. And then to run uh, CUDA, you know, they give us an example Docker file, and then we run it. We tell Docker to use all the GPUs. We're adding this uh, system resource uh, capability, and then we pass in this use mlock environment variable. Cool. So that's our Docker file. Pretty simple. We're basically copying uh, just evaluate.py into the container. I'll briefly go over this code. Uh, we've got some variables that are being passed in by the environment. And here's the weights and biases integration. So we call wb.init, which is saying, hey, we're doing an experiment here. I want to capture the information about what we're doing. And then we're passing in config so we can keep track of all the hyperparameters and the settings that we use for this specific experiment trial, things like what model we're using, what's the system prompt, um, as well as any of those environment variables that were passed in. And then this script supports calling out to GPT or running uh, one of those Llama models from Hugging Face. Uh, one important thing to note here as well is I'm referencing the weights and biases config object, which is essentially a dictionary to wire through all of those settings so that we can 
manually change them in the weights and biases UI in a moment. Then, you know, the main logic here is just looping over all of those examples in eval.json. We call our model, whether that's GPT or a local model, capture things like latency. Uh, and then for this case, we're using a metric that is uh, essentially a diff. So we're taking whatever the model output, and then we're comparing it to our ideal Docker command, and just counting how many characters are the same and how many aren't, and then we get a score between zero and one. Now, in the real world, we could, you could imagine doing something fancier here to evaluate the model. What you probably want to do is have the model generate a Docker command and then run that Docker command in an environment where you know the state of the Docker system and make assertions on the output of that Docker command. Because there's you know, more than one way to skin a cat. Like the, the English question could generate endless uh, permutations of Docker commands that are perfectly valid, valid and will work. But to keep it simple, we're just going to look at a diff from what we say is the ideal um, and what the truth was. Lastly, we call wnb.log. So this is actually passing metric information and our examples. So in our case, we created a table. This table contains the prompt, the output from the model, what the ideal answer was, uh, the actual score calculated by the, that diffing, the latency, and the number of tokens we use to, to call out to the API. So that table is getting logged here, as well as just averages of the accuracy, those scores of diffs, the average number of tokens, and the average latency. Cool. So with that, we can actually run this. If we go to the readme, we can see the Docker command. So we'll go here, execute. This is loading up in the Docker daemon. We now see weights and biases is running. It printed out a nice URL that we could use to track this. Uh, so while this is running, I can copy this and go to our UI. All right, so it's still starting up. We haven't logged any metrics yet, but we can see a lot of metadata about this instance. So we can see that we're running on a machine that has a Tesla V100 NVIDIA GPU. We got two CPUs. Um, we can see that we're calling evaluate.py and you know, what version of Linux. All of that was just captured automatically. Now, we also see all the configuration information that I would definitely want to know if I have to go back and, and analyze this thing. So we can see all of these hyperparameters that we've set. Uh, max tokens is 128. Temperature is 0 0.3. This is our system prompt. And we're currently using a model called Mistral uh, 7B which means this model is 7 billion parameters. So a lot smaller than GPT-3, which is 179 billion. But we can run it very quickly on a, on a small machine. Uh, so now if I go back here, we should actually see those metrics posted. So now I can see my diff score in this case was about 60% of the characters matched. Uh, the average number of tokens in, in this case was 120. And if I scroll down, I can now see the actual table of examples. So uh, for that question of spin up a new container named busy server run, our actual output was correct. The only thing missing was a forward slash in front of high priority. But pretty sure this would have been perfectly valid Docker command. Now for this case, please display the images in a table format with the repository tag ID and size included. We ended up just running Docker images, but what we wanted was to pass in format table with the columns that, that we wanted. So we, we missed this one. We can see that reflected in the diff score. It's down to 0 0.3. Cool. So this is all fine and good, but to actually evaluate across all of these models, so in my case, I have a simple file here called download models. There's three models, code llama 7 billion, code llama 13 billion, and then Mistral. Uh, there are many other models on Hugging Face that may or may not be right for your use case. But we can actually automate testing uh, what the best model is. So to do this, first I'm going to create a cube. So with weights and biases, we can actually automate all of this uh, directly in our UI. So first I'll create a queue. Let's name this queue LLM eval CUDA. 
We're going to use the Docker container mode. We also support running in Kubernetes, SageMaker, or Vertex. And then we need to provide the queue with a little configuration information. So I'll just copy that from our readme here. These are providing default arguments to the Docker run commands that are ultimately going to be executed, right? So if you remember from earlier, we need to say use all the GPUs. We're also going to mount in the volume that has all of our downloaded models, and we're going to add that sys resource capability. All right, so now that this queue is created, uh, we need to create a job. So I built this Docker container called LLM eval, which we ran here, WNB eval dash LLM CUDA. It's just built here on this local um, system. If I go back to my readme, I can create a job based on this actual Docker container. Uh, so this is saying I want to expose a job to the weights and biases uh, system that now I can execute automatically using this queue. Now the last step is to actually run an agent. So this agent is going to be linked specifically to this queue, LLM of Alcuda, and we can run it on that notebook instance in Google Cloud. All right, so now my agent is running. Everything's hooked up. We can get away from our terminal and now use the weights and biases UI to uh, schedule evaluations. So let's go back to LLM eval. Here's our project. We've got one run. Uh, I can go to jobs. I can see my LLM eval CUDA job, which I just created. And let's go ahead and launch it. And we'll just use the default settings. OK, so now that the job is launched, shortly we're going to see the job appear in the Weights and Biases UI. You can see our agent actually picked it up, and now it's executing things. So why is Glade 3 is our, is our new experiment. And we can see in this case, why is Glade 3 had worse accuracy than the first example. It used fewer tokens, which could be good. Tokens are a good proxy for cost or computation. Um, and it had lower latency, it was faster, but it performed worse. Uh, cool, so this is all fine and dandy. Um, I guess we probably want to like easily see which uh, models we're looking at. So here now we can see that uh, the green is representing the code llama 7 billion. And the other one is Mistral 7 billion. And the other thing that we vary between these is the temperature. So temperature for an LLM is basically a proxy to say, how creative do you want the LLM to be? When the LLM is making predictions, we basically feed in some set of text, and then its only job is predict, predict the next piece of text, which is, you could think of it as a word. It's usually like a part of a word. We call this a token. Uh, when it predicts that, it's going to spit out a whole bunch of probabilities. And it's going to say, OK, I think this token is like 20% likely. That token is 19% likely. That one is like 15% likely. If temperature is zero, it's always going to pick the most likely token. If temperature is higher than zero, it's going to randomly choose one of the other highly likely tokens to kind of make it more creative or interesting. In our use case here, we might want a lower temperature so that the model is more consistent. It's you know, not getting too creative here. We just need Docker commands. But we can test this out. So uh, you know, here I could go to my Mistral, which seemed promising. Uh, or actually, I need to go to that the second one. So let's go to Wise Glade, go to the overview. I can clone this run. And now I can change the temperature to 0 0.2 and launch. 
and now I've quickly you know, taken an existing experiment, and now I'm kind of thinking, huh, I wonder if temperature is going to give me better results. I can try it with this specific model with just the click of a button. Behind the scenes, we can see in our, in our container um, that model is now being evaluated. Uh, and back in weights and biases, now we can go to our dashboard and see uh, where that one ended up. So the lower temperature didn't seem to affect accuracy. It did increase the number of, of tokens. And latency was, was the same, which, which makes sense. So this is all fine and good, but it's a very manual process for me to go into each one of these and tweak one thing at a time. So the last thing we're going to do today is use weights and biases sweeps to automate the exploration of a space um, for this specific use case. So I've written a sweep.yaml file uh, that we can put into our interface here. What this is saying is, OK, we want you to sweep over the following hyperparameters. We want you to try code llama 13 billion, code llama 7 billion, Mistral 7 billion, and let's also do GPT 3.5 turbo. Uh, I want you to try two different system prompts. So we're telling it, you're a Docker expert. Translate the following sentence to a simple Docker command. Or you'll be asked a question about Docker. Your job is to convert this question to a succinct answer. Um, lastly, we can try values of temperature between 0 and 0 0.6 using a uniform distribution. So I want to run this just in our launch queue, since we already have it. So I can select LLM of Alcuda. Again, all of the default settings. And we can go ahead and launch our sweep. So now it's going to automatically try all of these different combinations. And I can go on a walk or to a restaurant while this is happening and not need to touch anything. And you can actually open it up on your phone and like check it. I did this last night, which is just really satisfying to like kick something like this off, go away, and then you can you know, dive in and debug uh, what's going on. You can see logs from any of these commands. Uh, and then, of course, the actual uh, results. So if I go back to my sweep page, uh, we can see we've got one trial completed so far, but a number of them are queued up. And we've automatically created some really useful visualizations to help you understand which models are better than the others. And we can customize any of these vi visualizations. So here I'm showing diff score over time. Maybe as a third dimension, I want to see temperature. So I can visually understand if temperature is, is correlated with my accuracy. Um, we also have this, one of my favorite charts, the parallel coordinates plot, which allows us to compare a number of different hyperparameters against an accuracy metric. So on the left-hand side is our accuracy metric. Higher is better. And then we've got three different hyperparameters that we're comparing. The system prompt, so which one was used in the example and then which model was actually used. Um, so this sweep is going to run. Uh, each run takes about a minute, so we're not going to have time to watch this specific one run. But don't worry, fear not. I let it run overnight and have you know, 500 examples in, in this dashboard. So uh, here, the color of the dots in my scatter plot actually show the average number of tokens. So the more yellow the color is, the more tokens that were actually consumed by this specific model configuration. When I hover over, I can see more information. So this was code llama 13 billion with a temperature of 0.47, and we used 109 tokens. If I look at this, I can see, all right, the ones that are the most accurate consistently is GPT. 3.5 turbo. It's beating out all of my open source models, which isn't surprising. It's a much larger model. But maybe I want to see just among my smaller models which one's better. So we can filter down all of our experiments and weights and biases to say, only show me experiments that aren't GPT 3.5 turbo. So now all of our, our visualizations updated, and we can see that the best performing model is Code Llama 13 billion, which again isn't Surprising, because it's larger than the other two models. So more parameters, more accuracy. This parameter importance panel can help us guide our search going forward. So this is saying, with the current data, 
uh, which hyperparameters are actually correlated with um, performance. So in this case, it's saying when the model is the code llama 13 billion, that's highly correlated with good performance. It's basically telling us that the 13 billion model is a really good performing model. Um, and it's saying here, temperature is negatively correlated with performance, which means the higher temperature is, the less performing the model is. So I probably want to you know, reduce my temperature. Now the last thing we can do with this beautiful parallel coordinates plot is say, all right, well, let's see if we can see other, any other um, correlations in this chart. So now if I select just my top performing models, I can visually see where in my hyperparameter space um, things are. So for my top performing models, the second prompt is correlated with higher performance. More of those models are going through that longer prompt, um, which is interesting. One good performing one did, but most are down here. And you can see generally lower temperature values are correlated with, with higher performance. So now as I continue to tweak hyperparameters, I can really dial things in. Uh, We can also do cool things with our, our table here. So what I've done in this table is I've actually grouped it by the prompt. So now we can see across all of our models, uh, you know, what is the average score? So we could see which models or which prompts are kind of most challenging um, for the model. So if I search this table now by the average score, we can see kind of the toughest prompts. Uh, I wanted to go the other way here. that was showing the easiest. Cool. Uh, so please run an HTTPD server on port 8080 using the latest image. It's not nailing this, or maybe it's totally getting it right, but the fact that we're just doing a diff with a very simple version of this is showing us that it's not performing well. Uh, that is the demo, guys. Um, you can learn more about all of the weights and biases tools that can help with LLMs at wb.me slash LLMs. And uh, yeah, would love to stay in touch. Hit me up on Twitter. I mean, X, I read the biography. This, I couldn't stop turning the pages. Insane. Uh, that man is insane. Thank you very much. I'll take uh, questions. Any questions? So thank you for such a great talk. I just had a, I just had a couple of questions. Like, how does Van B find optimal um, parameter in the hyperparameter space for different models? Is it independent of independent of each other for each model? Like, how is, how does that work? Yeah. So the question. Well, you could all hear the question. Uh, weights and biases sweeps that feature I showed that was trying all the different combinations. Uh, it supports a number of different search methods. So I ran a random sweep, uh, which we defined in that sweep YAML. I'm saying method equals random. You could change this to method equals Bayes, which is a Bayesian optimization based approach. Or you could change the method to hyperband, which is a really popular hyperparameter search method. And then it's going to be really smart about searching the space and kind of not try things that, that aren't promising. This is just trying everything randomly. We also support connecting to uh, third-party schedulers. So if you were using uh, Optune as a really good open source kind of scheduling library, you can connect that to Weights and Biases Sweeps and still get all the nice UI and kind of scheduling components of this. I got another question. Like, there are other observability and monitoring tools in the market, for example. Um, Can't hear. So there are other tools like uh, helping in observability and monitoring. Um, for example, Arise AI and um, TrueLens. So how is like that different from uh, Van B? Uh, yeah, there's definitely overlap um, in Arise and Weights and Biases. Weights and Biases started with this experiment tracking piece, saying like you're going to run some Python code somewhere. It might be training a model. It could be evaluating a model. Uh, Weights and Biases has since expanded to actually have monitoring visualization, things that Arise has. Um, so there is, there is certainly overlap. 
weights and biases is better. That's, that's the answer. Do you have any cost monitoring stuff for your sweeps and stuff like that? Uh, one more time. Sorry, do you have any cost monitoring stuff in, built into this dashboard for the sweeps and stuff like that? Like, uh, how do I not spend a billion dollars? Do you have help with that? Yeah. Uh, so when you start a sweep, you can specify like a maximum number of trials. And we do have a feature where if you configure it, we'll give you an estimate of what we think it's going to cost. So you can start to, to manage um, the actual resource usage. But by default, like this, the one I just ran is going to run forever, which is cool. But yeah, maybe, maybe not if you're paying the infrastructure bill. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Go build some sick LLM apps. Thank <laughs> you.